So, your group is switching to Pathfinder 2nd Edition on Foundry, and you're looking for a little guidance on how to navigate your new foray into virtual tabletop gaming. Let's lay out all the basics for being a player in a Pathfinder 2e game on Foundry. This video will be about playing PF2e in Foundry specifically, and I'm assuming you already have a solid grasp on the rules. If not, I'll put some rules resources in the description. The first time you log into your game, you'll be greeted with this pop-up. This is your user configuration. Let's quickly run through what you can change here. Your player avatar is only relevant if you're using Foundry's built-in video chat. You probably won't be able to change this icon yourself unless your GM has given you permissions to use the file browser, so feel free to skip this. Your player color will change the color of the dot used to represent you, and change the color of your canvas pings. Feel free to pick your favorite color. There are a few client-side rules you can change for yourself if you like, but if you aren't sure what these do, it's probably best to leave them all enabled for now. And if your GM has already assigned you an actor, an actor being the foundry word for characters, then you can select your character at the bottom. And if you ever need to get back to this menu, you can right-click on yourself in the bottom left panel. Okay, now you're in. So what can you do here? Well, first things first, we should take a look at your character sheet. To find your character sheet, we're going to head over to the right-hand sidebar and select the Actors tab here. If you don't see anything in this tab, then your GM hasn't assigned you permissions over an actor yet. But in this case, we can see that that's been done already, and we can simply click on the actor to open up the character sheet. If you assigned this actor to your user in the last step, you can also press C on your keyboard to open and close your character sheet at any time. So there's a lot of stuff going on here, and if you want a detailed breakdown of each tab of the character sheet, I'll link a playlist of videos created by the volunteer dev team that explains each tab more thoroughly, but here we'll just go over the basics. Firstly, you can change your character's name at the top. You can also see your hero point counter here. Your level is on the right, along with your XP tracker. You'll notice that the left-hand panel is always visible, because it has some of your most important info, including your HP, armor class, perception, initiative, saves, and more. And here in the center is the meat of the character sheet, which changes depending on the tab you're on. Let's quickly set up a basic character. If you have permissions to do so, you can click on the Mystery Man icon to change your character art. Otherwise, you'll have to have your GM do it for you. Fields that have a plus icon can be clicked on to open a list of options, and then you can simply drag your choice into the field. So let's make an elf. When we do that, many other aspects of our character sheet update automatically, like HP and some ability scores. Neat. Let's go through the rest. We'll play a cavern elf, rogue, with a thief racket, and the criminal background. The character sheet detects things like dark vision from our heritage automatically, which you can see down here. The rest of the fields can be filled out at your leisure, but with your ABCs filled out, we can set your ability scores below. Your ability scores are laid out so you can choose your boosts for each section of your character creation. Our ancestry has two boosts and a flaw locked in already, with one boost of our choice. Or we can tick the box for alternate boosts added with the fourth errata to the core rulebook, and simply choose two free boosts. We can also choose to add voluntary flaws for roleplay purposes, or use the legacy flaws to get a boost in exchange for picking two flaws. We can then pick our boosts for our background, and set our key ability score for our class. And then of course, we can choose our four free boosts at level 1. Very simple. Of course, this isn't everything you get at level 1. If you know additional languages, you can add them down by your other traits. And to set up our skills, let's shift over to this tab with the hand icon. You can see our set skills have been given the proper proficiency already, but we can add our additional skills manually by clicking on the dropdown and selecting our level of training. And if we jump one more tab over, this one with the metal, we can see our feats and features. Since we've selected our ABCs already, the character sheet intelligently provides us with empty slots for each feat we should have at our level. To browse for a specific type of feat, click the magnifying glass next to each field. You can browse through every feat available to you, and when you find one you like, drag it onto the sheet like this. If you're playing a spellcaster, you can find the spellcasting tab here. Spellcasting is not automated yet, so you'll simply have to add your type of spellcasting manually. Odds are, you'll be picking either Prepared, Spontaneous, or Focus. And then you'll select your Magical Tradition and set your spellcasting ability. Make sure to check in with your GM if you aren't sure what type of spellcaster you are. And just like that, your character is mostly set up. When you level up by changing the number in the top right, the process will be much the same. 
If you ever want to browse for content on your own, you can head over to this tab in the sidebar, the Compendiums tab. You may not have access to every compendium, depending on what your GM has allowed you to see, but here you can search for literally anything in the game. Items, ancestries, feats, macros, anything. It's all here, and it's all free. And adding items to your sheet is as easy as dragging and dropping. Alternatively, if you want to go shopping, you can go to your inventory tab on the sheet, click the magnifying glass on a category, find the item you like, and either click on the coins icon to purchase the item and automatically subtract the proper amount of coin from your character sheet, or press the hand icon to take it for free. Continuing through the character sheet, how do we actually use it in play? Well, it's really simple. When you click on something rollable, let's use a saving throw for example, you'll get a dialog box. The box lays out all modifiers applying to the roll, which you can toggle on and off if you need to. If you have a situational feat like Trap Finder, you'll see that feat in the list, and you can enable it when appropriate. You can also add custom modifiers to your rolls, roll multiple dice and keep either higher or lower, as well as set the roll mode, which I'll get back to in a minute. And then just roll. The roll will be placed into the chat tab of the sidebar, and includes all the modifiers. If there's nothing fancy with the roll you're making, and you know you won't need to change any modifiers, you can hold shift and click, which skips the dialog and rolls right away. If you want that behavior to be the default, then in the settings menu of the roll dialog box, you can uncheck this box here. Cool. So back to those roll modes. As you know, Pathfinder 2e has secret checks that are usually rolled by the GM. Foundry makes things a little easier for you. If you set your roll mode to a blind GM roll, Foundry will roll the dice as usual, but only your GM will be able to see the result. This makes their life a little easier. And if you want to quickly roll a blind roll, you can hold control when you click on something. Okay, but let's address the elephant in the room. What about combat? Well, let me add some equipment to our rogue here, set up a quick encounter, and I'll show you. Combat is mostly going to take place for you in your Actions tab, and your Spells tab if you're a spellcaster. Your Actions tab has a list of weapons that you have in your inventory, but you'll notice that by default, you can only strike with weapons that you have held in your hand. If I jump to my inventory, you can see that I've opted to have a torch in one hand and a rapier in the other. But I also have a dagger that is worn on my person. So, in my Actions tab, I can strike with my rapier or my torch, and I can also light and extinguish my torch with this checkbox since I'm currently holding it. And each item has the option to either sheath, drop, or draw my weapons. It's worth noting that pressing the drop button won't remove it from your sheet, it merely serves to give you a reminder that the weapon is currently on the ground somewhere. Back to the combat demo, I'm actually going to sheath my torch and draw my dagger, relying on my dark vision to see. I'm also going to tell my GM that I'm using the avoid notice activity, and I'll roll my blind stealth check by control clicking on stealth. So, time to walk through the dungeon, either by clicking and dragging my token, or using the arrow keys while I have it selected. If you can't select your token, make sure you're using the token controls tool in the top left here, otherwise you'll be creating templates or drawings. While walking, I stumble across a creature in my way who must also have dark vision because they notice me and the GM begins combat. To see the combat tracker, open this tab in the sidebar. Right clicking on the icon will pop out the tab so you can move it elsewhere while keeping the chat open. If we wanted, we could press the die icon next to our character in the combat tracker to roll for initiative. But before we do that, we have to tell the system that we're using stealth to roll initiative. On the left tab of your character sheet, you can set your initiative skill in the drop down menu here, and it's that easy. When we roll initiative either with the button in the combat tracker or from our sheet, it will use our stealth modifier. We're up first, and since we rolled stealth for initiative, this creature is flat footed to us. The GM can quickly add the flat footed condition to it, which automatically adjusts its AC. Now it's our turn. Actions are not strictly tracked or enforced in the PF2E system, as it would very likely be too restrictive. So we'll keep track of our actions ourselves. Since we already had our weapons drawn, we'll use our first action to stride up to the creature. Now to strike. First things first, when you want to attack a creature, hover your cursor over the token you want to attack and press T on your keyboard for target. It's important to note that targeting like this is not the same as selecting. Selecting is what you do by clicking, and it takes control of a token. Targeting is the equivalent of pointing to another token and saying, I want to affect that one. With the creature targeted, we're telling the system we want to attack it. So let's go into our Actions tab, 
and since this is our first attack, simply press the strike button by our rapier. The dice rolls, and the result comes in at the chat, including our degree of success. Since we succeeded, we can click on the damage button to roll damage, and the system will automatically detect that the creature was flat-footed and roll our sneak attack damage. The GM will then apply the damage for us. What a hit! Let's pretend that didn't just kill the creature in one hit. For our last action, we can strike with our dagger to take advantage of its lower multiple attack penalty. To attack again, instead of clicking strike, we can click on the first map button, which will apply the minus four penalty for us. And we want to click it in the first row here, as the second row with this arrow icon are the buttons for throwing the weapon. Still pretending this creature survived, it is now its turn. The GM goes through the same process and targets us with an attack, a hit. And in the chat, we see the damage rolled. With our character token selected, we can hover over the damage entry and click the damage button, which subtracts the amount from our current HP. Sweet. If you ever need to halve or double the damage, these buttons would apply that amount respectively. And if you want to use the shield block reaction while you have the raise a shield effect applied, you can toggle on this block feature here before applying the damage. And obviously the heal button heals you instead of damaging you. Okay, so applying damage is super easy. And we're still up. But for the sake of demonstration, we're going to pretend this creature targets us with a spell. Time for a basic reflex save. Spells and abilities that require saving throws will have a button in the chat card that, when clicked, automatically rolls the save for us and lets us know our degree of success. And let's say we weren't happy with this result. We can right-click on any of our rolls and re-roll with a hero point. When all is said and done, we can apply any damage we might take the same way as before. And that's the basics of combat. This would continue until one side drops dead or gives up. While navigating your character sheet and participating in combat make up the meat of what you'll be doing as a player in Foundry, let's do a lightning round of quick tips for you before we end the video. In most cases, if you have some sort of feat that gives you a bonus against something, like how a Dragon Slayer shield gives you a plus two bonus to will saves against a dragon's Frightful Presence ability, those bonuses will be applied to your rolls or stats automatically. Like here, when Valoros rolls a saving throw against the ability in question, his plus two bonus is toggled on by default. You can click and drag any of these checkboxes in your actions tab onto an empty space in your macro bar here at the bottom, which allows you to check or uncheck it without having your sheet open. You can also do the same for items, weapons, spells, pretty much anything. Experiment and see what you can do with macros. If your character is a fan of certain skill actions in combat, like shoving or tripping, you can usually add a macro to your macro bar to make that action easier. So, we could come back over to the Compendiums tab, search for Trip, and go down to the Macro section, and in this case, Trip does have an action macro. We can drag it to our bar, target a creature, and then execute the macro. This gives us a degree of success just like attacks do. And if we happen to critically fail, we can drag the prone condition right onto our token. And you can right-click on any condition to remove it. If you need to quickly measure the distance between something, you can do that. With the token tool selected, hold control and then simply click and drag. While continuing to hold control, you can left click to add points along the path, and right click to walk them back. If you drag a path that starts from your token like this, you can press space when you're finished to send your token along the movement path. Great for pathing out complex stride actions. And with that, that's more than what you need to know as a player in a Pathfinder 2e game on Foundry. If you still have questions, feel free to join the community Discord server where there are tons of helpful people around who can give you some guidance. Or, of course, feel free to leave a comment. And until next time, take care.